And we begin tonight with the increasingly dangerous rhetoric coming out of the American right. On Thursday, Fox's Greg Gutfield went on the air and said this. We had a war over slavery. We knew slavery was inhumane and immoral, but somehow we couldn't solve slavery peacefully. It was an evil, but one side refused to acknowledge that it was evil because it was too big of an admission for them to make. Doesn't that feel that way now, that this defiant refusal to reverse this decline argues against the survival of a country? What does that leave you with? It leaves you with you need to make war to bring peace because you have a side that cannot change because then that means an admission that their beliefs have been corrupt all the time. So in a way, you have to force them sur to surrender. Or we but could make love, not war. Uh, I tried that once. Oh, we have an election. I had to go to a doctor. <laughs> right. <laughs> election, yeah. What no, elections out. don't work. We know that. We know they don't work. Just stop for a second and think about what he just told millions of Americans, that this country needs war to bring peace because you have a side that cannot change. You have to force them to surrender. And he couched his little rant in the Civil War, a war in which the people who could not change and whose beliefs were corrupt the whole time shot and killed U.S. troops and declared war on the United States as well as secession for the purposes of keeping millions of people in bondage. So what exactly are you suggesting, Greg? Because in addition to civil war, it sure sounds like you're calling for an end to elections. So then what? Are you calling for violence against Democrats until they bend the knee? And what happens next? Do you militarize Democratic states and cities and force the 84 million people who voted for President Biden and the majority of Americans who want women to own their own bodies and gun reform and police reform and to save the climate and let LGBTQ people live their lives? Will that majority have to live under armed occupation? This is the madness that is being broadcast to millions of Americans on one of Fox's most popular shows, apparently with the full support of Rupert and Lachlan Murdoch. To be clear, no normal news network would allow that to be said on air. But you can say it on Fox. I should note we reached out to Fox, but we did not receive a response in regard to whether or not this is acceptable. The same day that Greg Gutfield was calling for a new civil war, we learned that a man was arrested in Madison, Wisconsin, because he illegally brought a loaded handgun into the Wisconsin Capitol, demanding to see Democratic Governor Tony Evers. Then, after posting bail, he returned to the Capitol with an assault rifle. Fortunately, the governor was not there. Less fortunate, is the indigenous justice activist who was shot in the chest last week by a man wearing a Make America Great Again hat during a protest against the reinstallation of a statue honoring a Spanish conquistador in New Mexico. According to the arrest affidavit, the perpetrator was smiling and laughing during an interview with investigators. These are just two recent examples, but in the age of Trump, we have seen a long list of violent attacks. From the anti-Semitic terrorist attack that took place at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the deadly stabbing of O'Shea Sibley, a black gay man who was murdered for dancing with friends at a New York City gas station, to the deadly massacre at an El Paso Walmart where the gunman said, quote, which the gunman said was, quote, a response to the Hispanic invasion of Texas mirroring rhetoric that continues to be used by major conservative political figures and media organizations. And, of course, there is the assault on our Capitol back on January 6, 2021, when thousands of Trump supporters stormed Congress, assaulted police, and looked to lynch elected officials, including the Speaker of the House and the Vice President of the United States, for the apparent crime of certifying an election that was over, according to the U.S. Constitution. The list just goes on and on and on. And yet, despite all of these events, Republican rhetoric remains authoritarian and violent because that is what their leader does. Well, General Milley, what he did is really treasonous. If you look at what he said to China, uh, he's either stupid or it's treason. But what he said to China should never be allowed. That can never be allowed in our country. If you rob a store, you can fully expect to be shot as you are leaving that store. Shot.
We will take on the ultra-left-wing liars, losers, creeps, perverts, and freaks who are devouring the future of this state like a swarm of locusts. We've never seen anything like what's happening in Washington, and I think we have to take it over. We have to take over management of our capital. Nobody has ever seen anything like we're witnessing right now. It is a very sad thing for our country. Uh, it's poisoning the blood of our country. Uh, it's so bad, and people are coming in with disease. Poisoning the blood of our country. No Republicans have taken any meaningful steps to criticize their dear leader or demand that he rein in this dangerous garbage. Those who do, like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger or Mitt Romney, are immediately and quickly rejected by the party that they belong to far longer than Donald Trump did. Joining me now is Livia Troy, former Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor to Vice President Mike Pence, and Ruth ben Giat, professor of history at New York University and author of Strongmen, Mussolini to the President. Thank you both for being here. Olivia, I will start with you. Um, this is not new rhetoric for the far right. What's new is that the Republican Party is in on the game from Donald Trump on down. I want to play for you somebody who used to work for Donald Trump, as did you for a time. His name is Steve Bannon. He was Trump's advisor on his campaign. Um, and then he was a White House advisor. This man worked in the White House. Here he is talking about our attorney general and just keeping the violent rhetoric going. Your day's coming, dude. After January of 2025, when we go back over this whole illegitimate regime and we get into the receipts, he should be in prison for the rest of his life. And my God, if we do our job after we win, he will be in prison for the rest of his life. Olivia, the rhetoric now is civil war per Fox and imprisoning the attorney general per Steve Bannon. Your thoughts? You know, look, this is incredibly dangerous across the board. And I want to just be very clear about something. It's not just, uh, you know, people like Steve Bannon who are out there radicalizing Americans every single day on the exterior, right? And then you've got Trump going out there repeating some of the same rhetoric, by the way, that he used in 2016, right? He then went on to attempt to implement some of these actions that he spoke about on the campaign while doing policy as president. Remember, let, this is a man who said he wanted to shoot immigrants coming into our country. The migrants mm -hmm. coming in, he wanted to shoot at them. This is a man who wanted to shoot people during the Black Lives Matter protest. That's not hyperbole. I was in those meetings when he said it, and it made me sick to my stomach. So when they talk about these things externally, these are the things that they plan to carry out. And I just, I will just point to one thing. Just look at the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, where they're looking at clearing out the government, where there are over 70 organizations that are part of this broad coalition of conservatives. And I say that in quotes, because these are more extreme positions that are happening out there. And so when you look at what's happening in this machine of propaganda, and when you look at the potential of what is being planned out, should someone like Trump implement this agenda again, if should he return to office within the government, what's happening here, this is where it gets incredibly dangerous at the intersection of all of this. You know, and Ruth, I, I want to go back for a second to Greg Gutfield. Um, Greg Gutfield, I'm sure, lives in some sort of a penthouse in Manhattan. He's not going to be out there shooting anyone. Um, you know, he'll be on his yacht or whatever. You know, he's like a Tucker Carlson. They are sort of playing at and cosplaying like tough guys. But what he said, if you just, like, go back and look at what he said, he said elections don't work. What he means is that Republicans can't win elections on the issues they care about. They cannot win an election when they say they would like to ban abortion. Women uh, over women say no, even in red states. They can't win elections when it comes to things like gun reform. They have to gerrymander their states to make it so that we can't have gun reform. The majoritarian positions that he wants to now solve by having a civil war and forcing the majority to heal, to bend the knee, to do what he says, women to give birth because he says, and all of us to live the way they say, what he's saying is they are the Confederacy in this scenario. What, is, what do you make of the fact that that is allowed to be said? We sure as hell couldn't say it here. I'd be fired so fast. They wouldn't even let me clean my office out. They would just mail my stuff to me. But on Fox, you can say that, and everyone else sort of chortles along and no one, no one in management does anything. We couldn't even get a response. Your thoughts? 
Well, they're saying that because it's part of a, a very, uh, it's now, you know, Trump himself since 2016 has been engaged in a very relentless information war and psychological warfare to change Americans' ideas of violence. That from violence being something repugnant to violence being something that is necessary as a way to solve differences. As for the elections, you know, I think I go beyond. It's not just that they're saying they can't win elections. The end game of election denial is not uh, claiming that this or that election was corrupt. It's that we shouldn't have elections at all, right. that elections should not be the way we decide things. And, and so, you know, violence and uh, getting rid of elections, this is a mentality of coups. And a third of my book is about coups, and we had a coup. And so it's also not just Fox. Uh, Matt Gates showed up at the uh, uh, Iowa State Fair, and everyone's, you know, munching their corn dogs. And then he says, he's with Trump, he's there to support Trump, and he says, only through force will we bring change to Washington, D.C. And I hear that, where he's saying, okay, elections don't work in his own way. Uh, we're not going to use reform or legislation. We're going to use violence. So this message is being repeated in the party, in the media, uh, and all the other kind of uh, sectors and think tanks that Olivia is mentioning. So this is an overwhelming uh, kind of influence and psychological warfare campaign designed to get uh, create an appetite in Americans for some kind of authoritarian rule. Ever heard the old World War II expression, loose lips sink ships? It seems Donald Trump hasn't. New reporting gives us a new look into his cavalier handling of our national secrets. First reported by ABC, it seems that Trump shared information about American nuclear submarines and their capabilities with an Australian billionaire member of Mar-a-Lago, who then shared the information with scores of other people, according to sources familiar with the matter. The businessman, Anthony Pratt, reportedly discussed the submarines with Trump in April of 2021, three months after Trump left office. Sources told ABC, quote, in emails and conversations after meeting with Trump, Pratt described Trump's remarks to at least 45 others, including six journalists, 11 of his company's employees, 10 Australian officials, and three former Australian prime ministers. Meanwhile, sources told The New York Times that Trump's loose lips may have endangered the U.S. nuclear fleet. According to The Times, Trump revealed at least two pieces of critical information about the U.S. submarine's tactical capabilities, according to the people familiar with the matter. Those included how many nuclear warheads the vessels carried and how close they could get to their Russian counterparts without being detected. Both ABC and The New York Times point out that the disclosure was investigated by special counsel Jack Smith's team in connection with the investigation into Trump's hoarding of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Joining me now is Basil Smeichel, Democratic strategist and director of the public policy program at Hunter College. Dino Badala, host of The Dino Badala Show on Sirius XM. And Tara Setmeyer, senior advisor to The Lincoln Project and former Republican communications director. And Tara, ladies first, I'm going to start with you. You know, there was a time when, you know, the sort of basic Republican brand was pro-national security, pro-national security and anti-USSR. It's flipped now. And Donald Trump is now showing off our nuclear secrets to his friend who's a member of Mar-a-Lago. Uh, your thoughts on why there's so much silence from the former National Security Party on this? Uh, it's outrageous, Joy. The more we hear about how reckless Trump has been with our national secrets, the more infuriating it becomes that the Republican Party has allowed him to get away with this. This is the same party that grilled Hillary Clinton over, you know, phantom emails for years and years and years. And we have proven that Donald Trump has uh, has spoken out of turn about national security secrets more than once. Remember when he had the Russians in the Oval Office, for goodness sakes, and he revealed information about Israel? Um, you know, it's been... And, and Jack Smith has an entire case against him for his reckless uh, handling of national security secrets and documents. So, thankfully, at least he was Australian, which is part of our Five Eyes <laughs> intelligence apparatus of the five countries that we are friendly with and share intelligence. But this guy's a businessman, not an intelligence right. officer. And this was after he left the presidency. So Republicans are quiet about this because if they said anything, they'd be revealed with, as the hypocrites that they are on this issue. 
They've lost all credibility as the national security party. And it's infuriating for those who know better, who know the implications of someone as reckless and as dangerous as Donald Trump is when it comes to these things. So it really is just craven uh, political cowardice that they don't call Trump out on this because they know that they excused his behavior during his entire presidency and afterwards. You know, and Basil, you know, at some point, you know, I, think, I guess a lot of us who sort of are freaked out about this on a regular basis are waiting for Democrats to essentially assert themselves as the national security party, because at this point, they are. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, and listen, you know, Trump uh, made his bones on this kind of behavior, this sort of braggadocious behavior, either outright lying or just, you know, bragging on himself and where I come from. There should be consequences to that. And I uh, I would love for my Democratic friends and colleagues uh, to find ways to continue to hold him accountable. But the one, but one thing that I am concerned about, and I know, uh, you know, Mr. Pratt, we can talk about his wealth relative to, say, the My Pillow guy, who also seems hmm. to have a lot of access to Donald Trump. But what concerns me, and this kind of goes to your earlier segment, I wonder what these individuals around the world of means are doing with that money and that information. Are they moving any pieces on this large chessboard of ours in this world to try to take advantage of what Donald Trump has been consistently leaking to them? I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't think that I am. But I, I'm, I am concerned about the ways in which people with a tremendous amount of means in other countries across the globe have access to this man the, the, the loose lips that you talk about, the, the ability or the desire that he has to just be able to talk to people uh, uh, without any kind of guardrails and what they do with that information, even if it's sort of below the radar for, for most yeah. of the intelligence. Right. I mean, Dean, that's it, right? He, he, could, he, 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 one wonders if he took these, this stuff because he just wants to brag about it. But it's the question of who is he bragging to, right? And also, mm -hmm. who's in the pockets of his son in law, who got $2 billion from the Saudis? That's the challenge. Both Donald Trump and his son in law scream national security risk, and yet, this, just this silence about it in D.C. Well, I have to say, Joy, maybe at some level, this is Trump, a new benefit to joining Mar-a-Lago. You also get national secrets. <laughs> so not only tennis and golf and a pool, I'll give you national secrets of America. Here's the thing that really upsets me, and I say this maybe because I'm a lawyer. Jack Desher, 21-year-old airman, for, for just to show off to his friends, shared yep. national secrets, charged with two counts of espionage, is sitting yep. in a prison cell now awaiting trial. Donald Trump has been charged with 32 counts of espionage. 32 counts of espionage, my friends. I challenge everyone, find another case where someone is charged with 32 counts of espionage yeah. and is still out walking free and not in custody. <laughs> and the reason Pat Tejero was put in custody, the judge said he was concerned that other countries would make overtures to him and offer him safe haven in return for the secrets. That is Donald Trump to a T. If Donald Trump thinks he's losing 2024 or does lose, yeah. he will flee to Russia who will give him safe haven in return for our national secrets. We know that's the reality. Trump should be in a prison cell now, awaiting trial like every other American charged with far less in terms of espionage. Let me, my pillow guy was invoked, uh, but the word wealth was used in connection with him, which ain't true no more, apparently. Uh, he says he's broke. Uh, I'm going to stay with you for a moment, D. <laughs> I know Basil's still giving him credit, but he said that in a phone interview, we've lost everything. Every dime, all of it is gone. I, I just have to get your take on this guy throwing away his pillow empire for Donald Trump and conspiracy theories. Well, I used to be a, pra a practicing lawyer, and I never got paid in pillows before. So I guess that's what these lawyers are getting. He's like, bags of pillows being sent over. It's like a throw pillows, pillows to sleep on, pillows for beds. Look, this is another example of hit your wagon, the Donald Trump, and this is what you get. You, if you're lawyers, you get disbarred, or you get have to testify against them in court. If you're his buddies like this, you lose your your fortune, <laughs> if whatever you had, yeah. and others get charged with crime. So this is the story. Yeah. Don't hit your wagon of Donald Trump, folks, yet Jim Jordan and the GOP are doing this this very day.